Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Jill Brown, Director of Public Programs at Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust. Thank you for joining us today for a virtual tour of the museum's galleries given by Gabriella Karen, who has been a docent at the museum for many years. As you will learn from the tour, in addition to being a docent, Gabriella is also a child survivor of the Holocaust and a talented artist. As today is the first day we are presenting a virtual tour to the public, we ask your patience if we encounter any glitches in the technology. Gabriella's virtual tour will last around 45 minutes and after she's finished, she will answer questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please click on the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and type your question there. Gabriella, thank you so much for pre preparing this virtual tour and presenting it today. I will now hand the virtual microphone to you. My name is Gabriela Kerin. I'm a Holocaust survivor and I am also a docent here in the Los Angeles Museum of Holocaust. This is our beautiful building. It was started by Holocaust survivors in the early 60s. They brought all kinds of artifacts with them when they came to United States and they wanted to show it to people. They wanted people to understand what happened to us. And they started the museum and they brought in their bylaws that it should be always free so everybody come and see it. If you see the walls, the windows, the lines of the museum, nothing is straight. Everything is crooked because the life was unbelievable not real. It was not a normal way of living. And if you see behind these walls, people walking, there is life here. Behind these walls. We have a lot of artifacts that but people brought with them. Also, we have the Torah. The Torah is from Czechoslovakia. I am from the Slovak part. I was a small girl. I was eight year old when the Holocaust started. And my life changed. My childhood was taken away from me all my years between 8 and 14 were just unbelievable hard. This is Michelangelo's marble Moses. Beautiful, beautiful marble sculpture. This is the start of the museum. You can see the light and if you look through this hallway, you go inside the darkness of the Holocaust. These are the effects of the Holocaust. Six million Jewish people were murdered alongside five million non-Jewish people. These were homosexuals, people with disabilities, gypsies, Jehovah Witnesses, and Christians who were against Hitler. 11 million people were killed from 1941 to 1945. Four years, daily, 7,500 people were murdered. That was the biggest tragedy that happened on our soil in the United States. The September 11, 
3,000 people were killed, 7,500 for four years every day. It is a number, it's hard to understand. I have a sculpture about the six million Jewish people and also about five million not Jewish. The columns represent the Jewish people, the faces, the screaming faces. The leaves represent a falling leaf is not a life. It shows the Jewish people how much, how many lives they lost. And between the columns, I have the people with disabilities, courageous resistors, Christians who help Jewish people to survive, Jehovah Witnesses, Gypsies, and homosexuals. This room shows that there was a life before Holocaust like we lived in the democratic Czechoslovakia. In our wildest dreams, we could not have imagined what will happen, but it did. You see on the left side here, dolls, done by Trudy, beautiful dolls, and it shows Long before Hitler time, Jewish people in Europe had to wear a certain funny hats, some yellow scarf, and showing discrimination between people. Here we have people like Albert Einstein, in middle there, the little boy is Robert Geminder, and there on the left, it's little me. I was about six years old there, a very happy child, always laughing, smiling. If you look from this point to the end of the museum, you coming from the light to the darkness of the darkness of the Holocaust. This is when the Nuremberg Law started in the early 30s and it shows in the middle a lady. She had to wear this black where it's written. I was involved with a Jew, I am ashamed to Germany. Same thing on the bottom to this gentleman. I am ashamed to my race. See, all kind of terrible Nuremberg law started. Jewish people couldn't go to a park, couldn't all the rights were taken away, slowly, slowly. They had to wear signs that we are, in every language you can see what signs we had to wear. I remember my grandmother, she, she was ashamed, she didn't know what to do. She was a religious Jewish woman. She was trying to put a purse hiding the sign behind it because people spit on her as she was walking on the street and making the rude remarks. Discrimination, terrible, terrible times. We have all kind of insignia. We have a lot of drawers in the museum. You can pull them out, flags and here you can see a few of the things we have in the drawers. Children, German children, 
in Germany had to learn from children's books. On the left, there is a tall, good-looking German man, and on the right, a caricature of Jew. Do people look like this? In the middle of the screen, gentlemen, Jehovah Witnesses, he was discriminated, he was in the camps. I met him when he came to the museum and was talking to us and told us about his experiences. Here, I am having a whole World War II. Twelve windows to the unforgettable past. The first window shows the Shevastika coming, but the world was silent. Kristallacht, the night of burning glass. <laughs> November 9, 1938, all over Germany and Austria, they were burning Jewish synagogue. Hundreds of them burned to ground, thousand put on fire, and they were breaking into Jewish store windows, throwing out merchandise on the street and burning religious objects burning and they started to take people to the camp. This was the beginning of Holocaust and there was a window of opportunity to let children out, children from Austria, Germany, Czechoslovakia and Poland. But the world did not open their gates to let them in. And I was going from museum to museum, and there was not a word about it, and it bothered me. And I decided to do something about it. I, I could not understand that such a horror, such a terrible thing, like the Kristallnacht could happen. And this was the kinder transport that was allowed to leave Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia and Poland. Children from age 12, two, to age 17 were allowed to go. Here on the bottom, this is our chair board, chair person, Michelle Gold, mother. And when I was working on my sculpture, Michelle came to me and said, can I help you? And it was such a right timing. I was so overwhelmed with corresponding to the people trying to get pictures into my sculpture. And she was working on it for years diligently. And when we were ready with my sculpture and with her pictures, but I inserted in the Kinder transport. In each window, we have a child who was on the Kinder transport. About 600 children. And when we were ready, I, we looked at each other and said, Look how much material we have. Let's put it in a book. And this is the cover on the book. It's an educational book about this part of Holocaust. On the right, it's our Michelle 
left it's me i'm the illustrator michelle is the author memories that won't go away it's an educational book about this part of holocaust bunk beds can you imagine a twin size bed four to five people sleeping in it when one turned everybody had to turn around starving prisoner this much when the people were almost liberated when the people in the camp heard the shooting of the allies and they thought in a day or two we will be free the germans opened the gate and started to march people hundred and hundred miles to another camp it was middle of january freezing cold european winter people did not have proper clothes proper shoes no food no water more than half of the people died in this death march just few months before end of the war forced labor heavy physical work silence scream we could not say a word but our souls were screaming loud and clear a child is leaving mother hand cannot reach it and on top beginning of a jewish prayer shema israel gate of auschwitz written on it arbeit macht frei the work makes you free what a irony behind these gates railroad tracks going to crematoriums gas chambers the germans took away from us everything also the wedding rings and precise them as they are they created and cataloged everything last one it's a mountain of jewish stars mountain of dead people and from all this horror came out state of israel and i have the red cactus because everybody who is born in israel is called sabra and sabra is the fruit of the cactus sweet inside prickly outside this is how the world war to started september 1 1939 the invasion of poland now ghettos jewish people were put segregated special places in town theresienstadt was a model ghetto they allowed the swiss delegation to come in and for the day when they came they cleaned up the ghetto they dressed children taught them an opera to sing for them and they left there is nothing wrong there let's see for the day it was nice but my grandmother was taken from czech republic to terrazin and from terrazin to treblinka where she was killed 62 year lady mother of five children 
Her son, her grandson, their kid also. All the ghettos. In Warsaw, there was an uprising. People rebelled. And can you imagine Jewish people fighting against the big German army and holding the ghetto for 63 days. They tried. They tried. All of them. My mother joined the underground. She saved hundreds and hundreds of people. Everybody who could do it, their little share. You see this castle, beautiful castle, Hartheim Castle. It's a euthanasia center. Handicapped people, Germans, not Jewish people. Germans, 90,000 of them were killed by gas because of their disability. Van C conference. This is the place where the decision was made in one and a half hour that the killing with starvation and bullets is too slow and they will make six extermination camps where they will gas people. This man on the right, Heinrich Himmler, was supervising the extermination camps and when he was ready he was going to meet Hitler. His residency was in the Prague. The way to the airport to, in Prague has a very sharp U-turn. He was in a convertible with a chauffeur and as he was driving and the car has, has to stop almost in the sharp turn of the U to check people were waiting for him, started to shoot at him. He jumped up, he started to shoot at them and then he collapsed and a week later he died from his wounds. The Germans were so upset. Such a high official was killed. They decided the two men came from the town of Ligise in Czech Republic. That was not true. And they went into Ligice and killed everybody. I have a picture of 60 students, a school picture, teacher in the center, everybody got killed. And here I'm showing you the people who made the decision about to build the extermination camp. Very highly educated people with PhD, doctors, but apparently they did it. This is the extermination camp, Treblinka, where my grandmother was killed, Helmo, Sobibor, Majdanek, Belzec, 
in Auschwitz. And this is what happened afterwards. They were taking people, gathering them. This is when they arrived to Auschwitz or Birkenau. Mengele, who was standing there, was a doctor, high official, in Gestapo, standing there and pointing left and right. One side meant death with gas, other side, hard labor, starvation, six months about life expectancy. At the bottom here, we are we getting every couple of years exhibit parts from Auschwitz showing the positions what Jewish people had and brought with them. Look at the brush. Oh, small things, children, little plays. Oh, how sad. These are the people who were arriving and already here they are selected. You see no men here. This is from Auschwitz album that was found after um, war by a lady. The German photographed everything. And for some reason, the album laid on the floor there and she picked it up. And now it belongs to Yad Vashem. These are the pictures from the Auschwitz album. This is the gas, Cyclone B. The people were guessed. They are small crystals. Then they get air, they became gas. We have this model done by Thomas Blatt. It's Sobibor, also extermination camp. It's about two yards by two yards, a huge model. And this is where the escape happened about a year and a half before end of the war. Jewish people got together because this camp was gazing everybody who just arrived to this camp. Two hours later, they were all dead. Now, Thomas Blatt was 15 year old when he came with the whole family, siblings, parents, grandparents. He was selected by the leader of this camp as his shoeshine boy. He hardly realized it, but the whole family was guessed right away. He didn't know for a couple of days when he found out. There was an organized escape. About 500 people escaped from Sobibor. About 49 survived the war. It was one and a half years in very hard conditions in Poland to survive. These are the uniforms they had to wear. You see one of our survivors, John, Joe Alexander, showing us his statue. And in the middle, I made this 
in memory of my best friend. This is her number. She did survive. She was on the death march from Auschwitz. This room shows us people who help Jewish people to survive. Here in the first picture is Anna Frank. And there is Mib Gies that helped them. And she found the book, the diary of Anna Frank. And she hid it and gave it to her father when he returned. And this is the man who helped me to be here today. He was hiding eight people. We were, it was my mother and my father, and I was the only child to my parents. My aunt, my two uncles, and two friends of my parents. We were there nine months, and if you can imagine yourself for nine months, sitting on a chair, not be able to move around, not be able to talk, the only thing I could do was to read, and I was reading 14 hours a day. He brought me books, but he couldn't bring me books for a young girl, I was certain at this time. He brought me history books and I was reading whatever I got in my hand. And I want to tell you that everything can be taken away from you, but nobody can take away from you what you have in your head. Put good stuff in it, it's yours until you live. And this is a sculpture about my hiding. You see the German boots marching in front of the house. I see them. I saw them. But they didn't see me. The place of his apartment was in the center of the city of Bratislava, across the street of the Slovak Gestapo. Carol Bana brought us food. Everybody was watched. He couldn't bring too much. We were hungry all the time. Susa Mendes. He was a diplomat. He gave visas and passports. About 10,000 Jewish people he saved. They discovered what he was doing. They took away his license. His job was lost. But he became the righteous person among the nation after his death. And this is Arian Sendler, also one of the people who helped survive. She could enter the Warsaw ghetto. She was 18 year old, a social worker, and um, she smuggled out about two and a half thousand children, babies. She put in a jar the name of the baby and the name where she placed them. So if the parents come back, they could find the baby. Warsaw uprising. Jewish people were fighting for their life. And they were holding up the big German army for 63 days until they succeeded. 
to overtake. This is what American army found when they enter camps. General Eisenhower told their troops, take pictures, take out your camera, video, whatever you have. Hundred years from now, nobody will believe what happened. These are things what happened after war. They started war reparations, war crimes trials, rehabilitated people. And we have here 52 monitors. Um, it's no, 52,000 testimonies. We have 70 monitors. And um, each testimony takes about three hours. It was done by uh, Spielberg. He gathered testimonies of people. Each one is about two, three hours long. It takes a year until we will see uh, the same picture again. And it's a very valuable testimony about Holocaust. This is our survivor, Joe Alexander, watching one of the testimonies. And this is our children memorial. It's a huge outdoor patio with 1,200,000 holes memorizing children who were killed in Holocaust. I came up with the idea. I presented it to the director of the museum and I told him I should make a little papers. I brought a sample with a child on it and today and all these years when people come, children or grown-ups, they write a, write a little note to the child whose picture they get and put it in a hole. This is how we memorize the children. And I want to leave you with a message from Albert Einstein. The world is a dangerous place to live, not because of the people who are evil, but because of the people who don't do anything about it. Don't be a bystander. Speak up. Speak up. When you hear or see injustice. This is the only thing how we can fight it. Thank you for listening, and if you have questions, I will be more than happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriella. Uh, we all, of course, wish we could be in our beautiful museum building walking through the galleries, but you made it feel almost like we were there, sharing the uh, displays and the exhibit and weaving in your own personal story and your powerful art. So thank you so much for that. As Gabriella mentioned, she can answer questions. So if anyone has a question, uh, please type it in the Q&A. Um, I wanted to start by asking you, what is your favorite part of the museum to show visitors in person and why is that? I really like to show the Sobibor 
because it's visual and I explained the whole story about it, how it happened, how they escaped and all the details. Actually, I when they filmed it, it was still in the old museum and I walked in accidentally and I I just saw some cameras. Anyhow, Thomas Blood was explaining it, the one who made this model. And I just got glued to the floor. I couldn't move. I stayed there for hours watching it. So I, had, I heard firsthand how he escaped. Mm. What happened? It is really powerful to have it in the museum. It has such intricate detail and um, children in particular are really drawn to it and fascinated by the detail. Um, so several people from the audience are saying, thank you to you, it was beautifully done. Um, gratitude for your powerful tour from one of your fellow docents. Um, a question for you, how did you and your family reacclimate into society after being in hiding for so long? It's a very important and hard answer. We got liberated by Russians. These are not American or English soldiers. They were raping, rubbing, big problem. We still didn't dare to go out and we didn't have where to go. Today would say we are homeless. We still stayed with Carol Blanar when we were hidden about for six weeks. And um, my mother found an empty apartment finally. We didn't have furniture. Everything was taken away. And um, slowly, very slowly, the store we got back, but everything was broken there. Russian, they had a lot of wine and liquor and stuff, so everything was taken naturally and broken, everything on the floor. I remember my father hid some money behind the shelves and um, it was not too much, maybe $500 worth today. And um, in an envelope with a push pin in the back. When he saw what happened in the store, everything damaged, he went, he reached back, they didn't find the envelope. And he got the money. So this was one, it was maybe enough for two weeks to buy food, but it was something, more than nothing. We didn't have anything, anything by then. You know, to be nine months hidden. He didn't take money from us just for the food. It, uh, we ran out of money. Yeah. There was some money coming from United States through Switzerland. And since my mother was connected to the underground, somehow she was able to receive it. So we got for food a little bit. But there were very hard times. Do we have some other questions? Yes, we have a lot of questions and I'm reading through them. Um, a comment from someone who's a student at UCLA 
who says, thanks for sharing all this important information. The Einstein quote is sadly very relevant today. Um, someone is asking, how did the Nazis decide who was sent to the left and who was sent to the right, who was sent to the uh, gas chambers and who was selected for labor? Well, children, gas chamber. Old people, gas chamber. Mother with a child, gas chamber. Many times, the grandmother, if they were, or some older person, took the child so the mother can survive. Some mothers had a hard time to leave the child, so they bent. Some didn't. And mostly men and stronger men over age of 16 they're selected for labor and some women also who didn't have children who then alone and young enough strong enough so this is and Mengele was the one who was single-handedly did it he picked out the twins and he made experiments on them. Uh, someone is asking an interesting question. Do you find a difference between different groups of visitors, in particular students as opposed to the general public, um, and how they react to your tour and hearing your story? Different response, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Different response, different questions they ask. Yes, sure. Depends on age. But mostly, this is why they came to the museum to understand how it happened and why it happened and how it could have happened. So this is what they want to know. How, how it came to something like that. Mm -hmm. Do you find that students um, respond in a different way to your story than adults do? A little bit, yes. Yeah. Mostly, I feel that mostly they are sorry for young children because this is the future of every nation and so they respond to it more not that somebody older <laughs> is not valuable but the feeling usually goes to a younger generation Um, we are almost at an hour, so I have one last question for you, which is, is there a message that you would like to share with everyone who's, who's listening that you'd like them to remember? Well, I want to tell you that it does not matter what color eyes you have, what color hair you have, what color skin you have. We are all the same people. And we don't have to love everybody, but respect. Respect every person on this earth. We all have the right to be here. Thank you, Gabriella. Um, I speak for many people in our virtual audience for we want to thank you for sharing your story, for maintaining your composure when telling your own emotional story and doing such a thorough presentation. And in particular, um, big appreciation to you and to our, our docent Mirta for being the brave docents to, to do the first virtual tours.
uh, I know you put a lot of work into this and we really appreciate it. Um, before we sign off, I want to let everyone know about some of our upcoming programs. Tomorrow, Thursday, August 27th at 11 a.m., we will host a talk by Holocaust survivor Peter Epstein. Next Tuesday, September 1st at 11 a.m., please join us for our Building Bridges program, a monthly panel discussion with some of California's most respected community leaders on how we can work together to overcome our common challenges. This month's topic will be racism, prejudice, and anti-Semitism. You can find more information about these programs and all of our virtual events on our website, which is lamoth.org. The museum provides free uh, online, online programs like this one. If you are enjoying our programs, we ask that you please consider supporting our work, our work by going to our website, uh, lamoth.org and making a donation. Thank you again to Gabriella and to everyone for joining us today. Take care and we hope to see you again soon. <laughs>